uh, back again. Today, we have our greatest privilege to have uh, Professor David Gesbert from Uricum to give us a talk about uh, machine learning for communications. Now, uh, we are so happy to have David here because uh, everyone should know David is among the some of the best and most influential researchers when it comes to communications. Uh, for a very quick introduction, I try to be as quick as possible, although I look at his CV as pretty long and it does take some time to summarize. He got his PhD um, in Telecom France and was with Stanford also as a founding engineer in a Stanford spin-off at the time. He became a professor in Uricom in 2004. Now he received many awards. Um, um, there are so many, I'll, I'll just quote some of them that are related to SP, such as the 2012 uh, Signal Processing Society, SP Magazine Best Paper Award. Now, I personally really like that one because uh, I read that, okay? It has some influence on me at the time concerning uh, how we shift the paradigm from the day where we don't have CSIT, okay? Channel state information, and thereby you are uh, looking at space-time code. And then we start to look at how to use channel state information to do a better job, uh, including scheduling, things like that. I really like this paper. And also he received 2005, SPS, Young Author Best Paper Award, and many, many others. Now, apart from um, technical accomplishments, he also got many other um, accomplishments. Uh, editorial, he serves as co-editors of a number of journals, and also uh, also serve as the uh, technical program co-chair co for ICC 2017. Um, leadership recently, he chairs on or on the advisory board of a number of institutes and organizations, such as a Huawei funded chair on advanced wireless system beyond 6G. And he is uh, Thomas Reuters, highly cited researchers in, in computer science. Okay, so without further ado, I'll pass it to uh, David. David, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank you, first of all, for inviting me here on this on this platform. This is my, my first uh, worldwide uh, webinar of that kind. And I, I've seen from the past that this is really, really uh, well organized and so far a big success. I'm, I'm really pleased to be to be on this platform. Thank you very much. So let me get to my to my slides. Um, and should I share my screen now? Yes, because I should. Okay, tell me if you see my slides. Yes, okay, very good. All right, so, um, and let me try to get rid of this little, uh, like, like this. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you today about a, a topic that's uh, quite dear to my heart and I've been actively working on this problem um, for the last, I would say, four to five years not with machine learning, uh, initially trying to solve this particular line of problems with conventional optimization and, uh, and communication theory and signal processing techniques. And a couple of years, a couple of years ago, um, discovering that uh, this was a prime uh, terrain of, of battle for machine learning uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a potential uh, um, you know, method to, to, to finally uh, solve the, the problem. So I'm, I'm a bit uh, cryptic right now. You probably don't know what I'm talking about, but uh, you, I will try to clarify in, in a few uh, few seconds. So I want to say that this is joint work uh, with two of my uh, students, uh, Matteo and Paul. Paul uh, has graduated with me already some years ago and has uh, left the group now. And, and Matteo is a, is, a, is a PhD student uh, with me. Okay. So uh, the talk is entitled Learning to Team Play. So there's something about uh, machine learning in there and there's something about uh, team playing in there. So you may ask, uh, so where's the link with uh, communication and wireless? Well, um, the link will appear uh, uh, fairly quickly if I can manage to change the, my slide. It doesn't, let me switch the slide. I don't know, I don't know why. Okay, it doesn't let me, it doesn't let me switch the slide. Okay, finally, great. So let me, let me talk a little bit about uh, the use of artificial intelligence for, for, for communication wireless. 
in order to, to set the, uh, the, um, the context. So you know, there's been a number of talks on this platform, on your platform, talking about uh, the use of machine learning for wireless. So let's try to understand where it makes sense. So, you know, um, there's nothing new in there in saying that uh, machine learning is, can be used to solve problems where conventional mathematics and, and conventional modeling uh, cannot solve it, right? Another reason to use machine learning is when you have um, a large um, data sets that can be um, used. Uh, a third reason is because, as we know, there are um, hardware um, platforms now that are, make, that are available that make it uh, extremely powerful uh, to use machine learning and, and solve the high dimensional problems very quickly. Uh, but I want to stress uh, another point. So the first three points is what everybody has in mind usually to justify the use of machine learning in some cases. But I want to stress and add another point here which is my point number four, which is dealing with uncertainties. And that I think it's something that has not been uh, emphasized by far enough uh, so far, is the ability to machine learning to learn the environment when the environment includes a number of uncertainties about uh, the state of the system that you're observing. And as we know in, in uh, wireless, just like in many other fields, um, the basic problem is to take a decision on the basis of observations. For example, uh, you can make a decision about which um, power level to transmit at or which beam to select, which frequency to select at any point of time. And that, that decision is going to be based on observations about the channel. And by sense, these observations in the wireless world are typically noisy, so they are uncertain. And it turns out that machine learning is a great tool to learn how to be robust to a very wide, kind, very wide range of uncertainties. Uh, when actually to tackle uncertainties when the distribution of the noise is not known in advance is very hard to do with a classical uh, optimization tools. So this is the, the, the most important point here that I want to raise. And the next point, next most important point will be that, you know, if you're dealing with a single um, device that has to make a, a transmission decision, so you have to deal with uncertainties at that device, that's already hard enough. But if you have to deal with uncertainties at multiple devices that have to make joint decisions, that's even harder. And we will see that machine learning can play a big role there as well. Okay, so examples, past examples of using uh, uh, machine learning in, in the COM area has been, for example, at, a, at the physical layer, the use of autoencoders, uh, the use of machine learning to deal with impairments, hardware impairments, uh, or the use of machine learning to come up with various detection algorithms, like uh, detecting uh, automatically the, the, the coding and modulation of, of a receive signals. So we have seen th those examples, uh, and I, this is not by far, this is not uh, exclusive. There are many more uh, examples and there's no, no space for me to, to mention them all. You also have examples at higher up in the layers, um, typically looking at the uh, network uh, control, uh, trying to find problems in the network, trying to allocate resources across the network and trying to optimize the parameters of software defined uh, networks. But today, actually, I want to um, talk to you about a, another area, um, and I call it edge cooperation. So, and this has to do with uh, the idea that if you're dealing with a network where uh, potentially the uh, devices at the edge of the network have to make decisions and their decisions affect the quality of the network. So you would like those decisions to be somehow uh, coordinated with each other. And in some cases, you may not have the luxury of centralizing all these, all these decisions um, because uh, the, the observations based on which you are making your decisions may vary quickly over time. For example, if you're dealing with a mobile network, people are moving around in cars and or trains or, or trams and things are moving quite rapidly. And by the time you try to centralize everything, your decisions may be outdated. And this is why sometimes you, you need to make decisions on the edge. And this is becoming increasingly important in the context of 5G, but even more, it's gonna be important in the 6G area. 
Okay, so let me give you a, a couple of examples. Uh, so let's stay in the, in the world of wireless for a minute. So imagine that you are dealing uh, with um, multiple transmitters in the wireless networks. And there are different domains over which you can coordinate the decisions of these different transmitters, for example, allocating pilots. Um, let me try to use my pointer here. Allocating pilots, um, managing interference, being alignment, allocating resources, even caching, like knowing what content to cache where uh, is inherently a coordination decision when you are dealing with multiple uh, caches. Um, another area where you are dealing with coordination is other types of networks like robotic networks. Uh, people talk about self-driving cars. If you are dealing with a large number of self-driving cars, those cars will have to coordinate with each other uh, for example, look at this picture here down below. Uh, you may have a number of cars arriving in those crossroads. And if you want to uh, manage uh, traffic such that the traffic is as smooth as possible, uh, you would like to coordinate the action between the cars while making sure that the crash uh, probability uh, stays within a reasonable target. Okay, so in all these cases, uh, devices have to make decisions. And potentially, there's, no, there's not enough time to centralize everything through the backhaul when the channels vary quickly. Um, so in this case, you have to make your local uh, decision based on local observations, which are noisy. And you also need to somehow um, predict or make your decisions based on the prediction of what the other devices around you are going to do. But remember this, that those other devices also have noisy observations. So it becomes a very intricate problem where you want to, uh, you're willing to coordinate your decision with another device, but you have noisy observations and your uh, other device also has noisy observations and you don't really know what the other device is gonna do. So it's very hard for you to come up with an optimal policy for yourself if you don't know what the other device uh, is going to do. So uh, the thing is that, so th this goes back to uh, fundamentally the field of uh, decentralized control. And it, it's well known that these problems are very hard to solve. Um, it has been characterized in most cases to be and be hard problems. And um, basically, especially when the, the, the nature of the noise and uncertainties is, is not clear, like you don't know in advance the distribution, then basically it's, it's, you can forget about trying to come up with, with close form uh, uh, algorithms. So this is a wonderful territory for artificial intelligence. Let me try to build up a little bit more the intuition uh, by taking an example that's completely independent of, of, the, of the wireless uh, area. Let's take the example of cars uh, coming at a crossroad just to build up the example, the, uh, the intuition. Uh, so imagine that you have a bunch of cars coming at a crossroad. Uh, you have, uh, and I, I want to stress just to build up intuition that potentially uh, different devices may not have the same quality. So you may have a high-end car here, maybe the blue car is a high-end car, I don't know what it is, uh, very expensive BMW. And, and then you have here maybe like a, a low-end, a, a cheap, uh, I'm French, so I can take a French example without offending anyone. Let's say a cheap Peugeot, for example and uh, arriving at the crossroad. And they need to decide basically on a policy, uh, which is you know, whether accelerate or, or, or break or potentially stop. And you would like to optimize uh, the policies at each car while making sure that the crash probability stays within reasonable uh, boundaries. So it's okay to crash because I think a crash is not, cannot be avoided completely but there should be a very small probability of crash that is given in advance, right? And under that, that constraint, you want to maximize the flow of traffic. So you, want to, you would like both cars to go through the, the crossroad as quickly as possible. So this is exactly a very nice example of a decentralized uh, coordination problem under uncertainties. Why is there uns uh, uncertainties here? Well, there are uncertainties because the sensors that are used on each car to, to, uh, to help with the decisions, well, they, they have limited capabilities. So maybe the high-end car has very nice sensors. Maybe it can, it can see, I don't know, 
uh, 500 meters in advance with very high resolution, while the, the small car here may have only a 100 meter uh, um, range um, detection capability and, and with less resolution, okay? So based on this, you know, uh, so the, the, the thing is that most likely the, the, the high-end car knows that there's a low-end car coming, coming at the other side of the crossroad, but it, it doesn't know what it's gonna do. And the low-end car is also aware of the fact there's an, another car coming. It knows that it's a high-end car. So it knows that this other car, the blue car, has better uh, a vision of the environment than, than it has itself, but it doesn't really know what it's gonna do either. And, uh, and, and the low-end car is, is um, blinded by its own uh, limited sensor capability. So it's not very clear in advance what is the behavior that both of these cars should have. For example, um, should, should the high-end car uh, just um, accelerate and go past, you know, basically it has excellent sensors, so it knows what's, what's going on. So maybe it can uh, take the risk and then um, go quickly. Or maybe it should be aware of the fact that the, the green car is a low-end car and therefore it has a more unpredictable behavior. And as a result, maybe the, the blue car is going to be the, the more, uh, let's say, uh, danger uh, aware one and is going to maybe uh, break and letting the, the, the cheap car uh, pass by first. So this is this kind of behavior uh, um, in terms of uh, decentralized uh, coordination under uncertainties that we would like to, um, you know, um, model with algorithms and using machine learning. And we want to use this kind of, um, you know, um, behavior and, and, and see if it's useful in, in the wireless area. And you will see that, in fact, it's extremely useful. I will give you uh, some examples. Okay, great. Now that uh, we have built up the intuition, let's look at the, the underlying mathematics. Uh, to see how we can model um, this problem. Okay, so it's a team, it's, by the way, this kind of problem is it's called team decision. It's, uh, it's, this is a formalism that goes back several decades and it has to do with uh, how to make decisions among agents as a team. So you would like to optimize a common uh, utility, but uh, your own observations are local and you don't have access to the observations of the other members of the team, right? A little bit like uh, imagine a football team trying to score a goal and then uh, every football player playing blindfolded and trying to pass the ball to each other. So they, they all want to score the goal, but they don't really know where to pass the ball. So this is the, this kind of problem. Okay, great. So uh, this is how we're going to formalize the problem. So there is an environment here, which is represented by uh, a variable X. So in the wireless case, X will typically represent the state of the channel at all of the devices. Um, so this is not noisy, this is the, the real state. And then every device that has to make a decision, whether it's a car or whether it's a, it's a wireless transmitter, has access to only a noisy version of the state of the system. So agent one has access to X1 hat and agent K has access to xk hat okay now agent one doesn't know what agent k is seeing it only sees its own observation of the of the scene all right um and it has to make a decision so the actions are um, in the car, case of cars accelerate or brake and in the case of wireless transmitters it would be pick a beam pick a power level pick a frequency you name it, all kinds of decisions that can be used uh, in, a, in a transmitter, okay? And as a result of the joint set of actions, you get a certain utility, which we will call U. Okay, now what is very important to, to know in, in, in this particular model we're going to look at is that uh, while the instantaneous states of observations are only known locally, uh, the statistics are going to be assumed to be shared by everyone. This is very important. Uh, so basically it means that the underlying distribution, so there's a distribution of X and then the distribution of all uh, local noisy observations, uh, condition on X, all of that is known globally by all the agents. Okay. This is a little bit similar to in my uh, cross 
crossroad uh, problem where I said that the cheap car is aware that there's a high-end car coming up. And the high-end car is aware that there's a cheap car coming up. So they are all aware of each other's uh, sensor limitations, right? This, this captures this, the knowledge of this joint distribution here. Okay, so based on that, my goal is to determine uh, a set of policies, which are P1, P2, up to PK. And each one of these policies is a function that takes the local observations and, and transforms it into an action. All right, so at this stage, I have not optimized anything. I, I've only set the, my notation. So let me, let's see what we want to optimize. So, uh, Let's leave machine learning aside for a moment. This, is, this has nothing to do with machine learning. This is, this is a problem of uh, decentralized optimization of policies, right? So why is it decentralized? It's decentralized because each policy is only aware of the local observation. So this is why I have here a, a, a utility, the function of the true state of the system. And the policy at agent one is only a function of the state of agent one, but the, the resulting utility is only is also a function of the policy at agent K. But the policy at agent K only only acts on the observation at agent K. Okay, so I have utility here, um, but and what I want to do is I want to maximize the expected utility utility of the system. All right. So, uh, so this is difficult. This is difficult because precisely as you can see here, uh, each there's a number of policies of functions and each function is only uh, a function of a subset of parameters. And that's why the problem is a decentralized problem. Okay, so I want to find the, the set of policies that maximize this uh, joint expected utility. So hopefully this is clear. Let me move on now to my next slide. So before, before let me go back one second, just, just to reiterate the fact that, so this problem, which goes back to decentralized control does not have, unfortunately, does not have uh, tractable solutions for most cases. And unless, unless for from some very particular cases, for example, uh, when you are dealing with uh, quadratic utilities, and, and here, if you have um, simplified observation models like Gaussian, noisy Gaussian models, sometimes you, you can do things uh, with commercial mathematics. But if it's not, if it's not quadratic here, uh, most of the cases, you cannot do anything. So you are looking for uh, reasonable methods to solve this problem. How can, the, how can the cheap car and, and, and expensive car decide what to do when they arrive at this crossroad? So uh, fortunately, you have a number of benchmark strategies, like conventional strategies that you and I are aware of. Even if you, are not, if you did not think about it, you, you will recognize those, those, uh, those strategies. So I call them conventional strategies. Uh, they do not, do not require machine learning. Uh, they are fairly simple to state. So let me look at number one. So benchmark strategy number one. So I call it naive strategy and it's not robust. So uh, you will see that there are different levels of being robust. So let me define the first truly naive strategy, completely non-robust. Basically in this truly naive strategy, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna do two things. First, we're going to ignore the noise so if I take the car example, because it's really easy to, to build intuition with that, basically each car is going to assume it has wonderful sensors with perfect resolution, no noise, okay? So that's the number one thing, which means that I, I drop completely the expectations. I, I don't even try to deal with the distributions here. I just take my X hat as if X hat is X. And the number two assumptions I'm making, which is a very bad one, is that I'm going to make the assumptions that the other cars around me also have perfect observations. So if I come in with my expensive BMW, I will make the assumptions that everybody around me also have a very expensive BMW with trustable sensors, okay? Which obviously is not going to be a very good assumption in some cases, 
But uh, the good thing is that it gives you a workable solution. So in this case, basically the optimization problem becomes argmax. I want to find a number of policies and I'm going to solve this at every agent, every car, every device. So for example, at, every, at agent number one, I'm going to find all the policies. I'm going to throw away most of the policies. I'm, I'm, I'm going to just keep the first one because that's the only one I'm going to use in practice. And the other one has just like auxiliary variables, but I still have to work out the solution to come up with P1, with Pi1, sorry. So I want to find uh, a set of policies that maximize the, the, the joint utility. And basically I will, I will assume that X1 hat is equal to, to X and I will not be worried about it. So you see, I, I replaced the, the state of the system by X1 hat, X1 hat as if X1 hat is equal to X. Okay, so this is conventional optimization. No problem, I can solve this with, in, in most cases with, with classical uh, uh, search algorithms, uh, provided that, that U is not a too, a too complicated function. But I don't need machine learning for this. All right, the second strategy is number two, is also naive, but not that naive. In the second strategy, uh, Let's suppose I am the cheap car. I am the cheap car. I know that I'm driving a cheap, par, cheap car and I, I have the specifications of my sensors. I know the resolution of my sensors. I know they are pretty bad. And, 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 and therefore I'm going to be probably um, cautious, right? So I'm going to be robust, at least to my own local noise. Okay. But I don't know what the other guy is driving, so I will make a, a, a very a simple assumption. I will assume that he's also driving a, a cheap car, the same car as, as I have, right? So that way, basically, I, I, I simplify the problem. I deal with uncertainties, but I only dealing with my own uncertainties. I'm not trying to deal with, um, is, is the other person having a better estimate of the scene or worse estimate? I'm not worried about that. I'm going to simplify. So it's still naive in that sense, right? So you're, you're robust with respect to your own noise, but you're not robust with respect to the noise that may be existing at the other devices, okay? All right, so if you do that, if you are agent number one or car number one, uh, you're going to solve this optimization problem here. Uh, so it looks, uh, it looks similar to the first one, but the big difference now is that you, you're going to optimize an expectation because you can take into account uh, the noise statistics at your own sensors, right? So this is done here, but uh, you still, you're still not solving the full problem because as you can see, uh, when you work out the, 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 the policy, you basically assume that the other cars or the other devices um, basically have the same observations as what you have. Okay, so to be a bit more precise compared to what I said earlier, is not just that I'm assuming that the other cars around me have the same amount of uncertainties. No, I'm also assuming that they have the same observations. Okay. Because I don't know their observations, so, you know, that's, that's, that's the first reasonable assumption is to assume that they have the same observations as I have, even if it's not obviously a, sometimes a, a good assumption, but it's a, it's a simplified one. Okay, so you're gonna build up some robustness here, but you're, not going, you're going to be robust to your own noise, but you're not going to be robust with respect to uh, potential misaligned decisions between the agents. So if you're dealing with the, the high end car and the low end car problem, it may not solve the problem. And that's why it's still a naive strategy. Okay, so I hope that my benchmark strategies are clear. Now let, let me move to uh, the, the, the machine learning aspects. So we, we looked at this problem uh, uh, with the machine learning perspective. And we, we have considered basically two, two solutions and I'm going to first present the first solution. Okay, the first solution is called uh, team uh, DNNs. So basically we are going to use DNNs uh, in order to come up with, with the, the policy 
uh, making um, engines. So each, each device is going to have its own DNN embedded in the device, right? As opposed to many, many cases that you see talking about machine learning and communication where you, you optimize one DNN. No, here you need as many DNNs as you have agents. So that's a big difference. And then they're all acting as a team. Both cars in my crossword examples want to get through the crossword as quickly as possible. So they have a, a let's say, unified, unified objective. Uh, and they want to minimize the crash probability, both of them. So that's why they're acting as a team. OK, so uh, how are we going to do this? So DNNs are going to be used to represent the policies. And how am I going to train all of that? So let me move to the next slide. So this is the problem. Uh, now you see that my decision makers are going to be replaced by DNNs. Uh, the input of each DNN is uh, basically the local observations here. And then the output uh, layer of the DNN is going to be used to read out the action of each one of the agents. Okay. And then each DNN is parameterized by a set of um, weights parameters that I'm going to call theta. So theta i are the weights used uh, to create a policy at agent i. OK, uh, how am I going to train the DNN? Well, the key point is that uh, while this um, decision-making problem remains a decentralized one, because uh, you know the cars have to come up with their own decision. It's not, it's not, I'm not, not going to centralize uh, the data in, in the in the 5G network and then uh, send back all decisions. No, I, I, I want to make a quick decision. So I want I'm, I'm making decisions at the edge. So this is a decentralized decision making problem. However, the way I'm going to train uh, the DNNs has to be centralized. And that's okay because the training is done offline, as we know. So you can do the training offline in a centralized way. And then when you test the system or apply your, your DNNs, you, you're going to apply them in a decentralized mode. Okay, so this is what I wanted to clarify. Um, so basically, when I train, the, the state variable X is available everywhere, and I'm going to use it uh, to train the, uh, the DNNs. And I'm going to use the, the classical uh, gradient ascent method. <coughs> and and, um, and th there's, nothing, uh, there's nothing really new at that stage. Just the fact that you have a number of DNNs, not just one, that uh, centralized, sorry, training is done in a centralized manner and testing in a decentralized manner. So these are the, the key ingredients that that make it different from, from classical uh, machine learning from for communication uh, literature. All right, so this is a picture of the, the training mode where you can see that each agent is uh, um, being offered also a copy of the state, the true state of the system. And then uh, I'm also, uh, ex you know, I can exchange as much information as I want during the training because it's done offline, so no problem. Good. Um, the, the utility that I'm using uh, for the for the gradient is basically is well. It's it should be in principle the uh, the expectation, but in practice in practice is an is an empirical expectation, which is summed over all the data points that I have at my disposal. Again, nothing nothing uh, new here. This is a classical way of doing the training. Um, and that's pretty much it. So uh, each decision maker i is using the DNN with parameters theta i and input x i hat to come up with, with uh, an action ai. OK, now let's uh, look at one concrete example in wireless. So it turns out that the, the example that allows to build intuition in a way that is the easiest uh, into this problem is to look at power control. But I've mentioned different examples before in my presentation, including um, 
beam selection, uh, resource allocation, frequency selection, all of that are also pretty good examples for how these things could be used. But let's look at the, at the power control problem. Okay, so this is a power control problem. Uh, to keep notation simple, uh, simple I, I use two agents. So these are two transmitters, one and two, and they are trying to communicate with a receiver. Okay, so the, each receiver is only intended to receive a message from its own transmitter. And these links that you see here, these are just interference links that are basically a nuisance. They're not good. And they're not exploited and then they're not good and I have to deal with it. All right, so the state of the system here is characterized by a matrix. Uh, I'm going to average over the fast failing. So my power control is only based on uh, long-term gain information, which is collected in a two by two matrix, which I call G. Okay, so um, typically G12 and G21 may be a little bit weaker than the than G11, G22, but that that's about all I can say. And it's not even guaranteed, it depends. Uh, the point is, I want to make a power control decision at each device without knowing G. That's the issue here, right? So somehow I assume that there's a, a way to collect feedback from the receivers, for example. Uh, I mean, it could be TDD, FDD, you have different models that will be obtained. But in all these cases, uh, you only have a noisy uh, version of the uh, gain matrix. Okay, and typically, for example, in, in um, uh, FDD, you have to feed back uh, the, the, the gain matrix estimate over the air. And then depending on the quality of the uplink uh, channels, well, the estimate that you receive at the different agents may not be of the same quality, uh, which means that in the end, uh, each agent collects essentially a, a noisy version of the G matrix. Now, in practice, uh, every, every element of the G matrix may be uh, corrupted by a different amount of noise, but let's simplify notation. And let's suppose that I have the same amount of noise corrupting uh, each element, but this amount of noise may not be the same at transmitter one or transmitter two. For example, transmitter one may be closer to the, to the uh, devices and transmitter two may be a further away. So may, maybe uh, have uh, less uh, quality information about the G matrix. So this is um, typically modeled by this equation here that you see. So uh, agent I has access to an estimate G, G I hat and which is a noisy version of G. So the noise is actually coming from Delta here. Delta is uh, uh, typically, um, it could be a Gaussian noise. And then uh, Sigma is a, a weighting factor that corresponds to the noise power I'm going to um, spray at each agent. So if Sigma I is uh, closer to one, then essentially um, the observations at agent I becomes more and more useless, just noise. And if theta i converges to zero, then the information at that agent uh, becomes perfect. Okay, so th sigma i varies between zero and one. It, it, it describes all cases between uh, perfect knowledge of the, of the environment and then complete blindness. Okay, and what is very important is to know that the sigma one at transmitter one may not be the same as the one in sigma two. Just like with the two cars, you have a cheap car and expensive car with different quality of sensors there. Okay, so this is my model. Now, what, what do I need to do? Control the time. Uh, well, I want to find a, a, a power control policy. Uh, so it, the power control policy takes an estimate GI hat uh, into a power level. And I'm going to assume the power level is any, anywhere between zero and a maximum physical, uh, feasible power level Pmax, okay? Uh, the utility, for instance, could be the sum rate. So this could be, the, this is the sum rate if you're dealing with a simple interference channel. So th there's no multi-user decoding available here. There's no um, network MIMO available here. You can, you can embed these additional features and change the utility. Uh, but here to simplify, I, I, I assume single user decoding, you have a simple utility. 
And then the goal is to maximize, well, what I presented earlier, which is an expectation of the utility where I assume I know, I know in advance um, the joint distribution of the different um, estimates. So I know which transmitter has better estimates or, or worse estimates, for example. And both transmitters are aware of each other's uh, quality level. So that's, that's the meaning of this. Good, so I don't know how to solve this, by the way, with conventional mathematics. So I go to machine learning and I use my uh, team uh, DNNs and this is the result. So what I do is that here, I, I look at, at different uh, quality level, but to, to have presentable examples here, I have to, to limit the number of mutations. So I'm going to assume that uh, the, second, uh, the second transmitter has perfect information. Okay, so no noise there. And the first one has noise. And then I'm going to uh, call the amount of noise sigma. Okay, so, so here, if sigma is, is equal to zero, it means that both transmitters have perfect information about the wireless channel. And if sigma goes to one, it means that uh, uh, transmitter two has perfect information, but transmitter one is completely blind. And what we measure here is uh, as just to, to build up intuition, the, the percentage of transmission for each agent. So in blue is uh, number one and in red number two. So as you can see, uh, when both agents know what's going on, they have an equal chance of transmission, which is normal because my feeding statistics and, and gain statistics are, are all symmetric. So in, in, on average, they all have a, an equal chance of transmission and that's what they do. When one of them becomes uh, uh, blinded by noise, well, what happens here is that he sort of um, decreases the, the number of cases where he transmits. So he's much more cautious. He still transmits about 20% of the time because apparently this is the, 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 the best strategy what, rather than stopping transmission completely. He's still, try, he's still good to try 20% uh, of the, the, the time to try to transmit something and hope that uh, the interference will not kill it. While agent number two who has a perfect knowledge about the situation is very confident he actually transmits all the time. So in the, in the car crossroad example, this would mean that the BMW just zips by the crossroad, not worrying about anything. And the, the cheap car mostly uh, stays put, brakes at least 80% uh, of the time. And then 20% of the time is trying its luck and goes through the crossroad. I mean, it's just, this is just a, a funny analogy. I'm not claiming that this carries on at all to the car example, but this works for power control. All right. Now, let me show you an extension, a very inter interesting extension that we have uh, envisioned um, last year. So why, why did we need an extension? What's the problem with, with, the, with, the, with the solution here so far? Well, the main problem that is that you know, I had to assume that I was able to train my, uh, my agents based on knowing in advance how much noise I have at each one of them. Yeah, but this is not necessarily the case. Uh, it takes time to learn how much noise there is in the estimates, and it takes time to retrain the, uh, the agents uh, to act properly under that particular amount of noise. What if, what if in practice uh, you're, you're, you have a situation where the amount of noise is changing? For example, the transmitters may be moving around. Sometimes they have a good observation of the uh, state. Sometimes they have, they have a bad one, right? So the issue here is, uh, okay, so, well, what to do? I mean, you, you would like to have a, a, an artificial intelligence system that is able to react to any kind of uncertainties. And that doesn't have to be retrained every time the level of uncertainty is changing. Okay. So this is the prime we, we, we tackle next. Okay. So basically it means that this joint distribution, which was assumed to be fixed over time, now is no longer fixed. Okay, it's going to vary. And I would like a system that 
uh, allows you to nicely tackle the, the variations uh, of that joint distribution of estimates without having to retrain the, uh, all the DNS. Right? We, we know that online retraining is really a problem. I mean, if you're talking with, about wireless devices, online retraining is, uh, can, can uh, cause uh, basically um, a lack of connectivity for some time and it, it, may, it may create outage. Okay, so here's what, how we're going to do it. Uh, so I, I'm assuming that each agent has a noisy version of the true state, okay? And uh, sigma i is uh, the amount of noise that, uh, um, let's say, affects agent i. And all these noise levels are collected into a, a sigma vector here, just to simplify my notation. So sigma vector indicates uh, where am I operating in the space of uncertainties. So imagine you have two agents. I have a space of uncertainties, which is a, a matrix, right? Or a, a 2D area. And then depending on where am I in this area, it, it may mean that uh, both agents are blind or one of them is blind or, or both of them uh, are, have perfect information, depending on where you are. Okay. Um, now, the thing, also the thing to, to notice in this setting is that depending on where you are in the uncertainty space, so you know, this is the uncertainty space I was just talking about. So you have sigma one here, sigma two here. It turns out that uh, the optimal policy varies drastically uh, and suddenly when you move only a little bit in the uncertainty space. So this, this color coding represents uh, the level of activity of transmitter two for the power control problem. So for example, dark blue indicates that transmitter two is not transmitting, while uh, yellow indicates that it transmitting at full power, okay? And what you see is that in the beginning, I mean, this is, this is the area where both agents have pretty good knowledge of what's happening. And you see that, well, what's happening is the, 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 the agent two basically transmits, I mean, on average, a certain amount of, of power. And as you, as you go into the uncertainty space into the direction of one of them being uh, blinded, then you see that depending on which one is, is more blinded, then you have a, a drastic change in behavior. Like here, if, uh, if uh, agent one uh, has bad knowledge or slightly worse knowledge than agent two, then what happens is that agent two takes all the power and, and transmits fu fully. While if, if this is uh, agent two that is slightly less informed than agent one, then agent two is going to back off completely and stop transmitting. And it's actually, it's well known that it's, it's hard to, to uh, come up with, uh, with uh, uh, machine learning and, and, and DNN um, um, models that are able to capture uh, drugs, uh, sudden change uh, in behavior, depending on the on the environments and depending on the noise statistics, because after all, DNNs are are continuous functions. So it's 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 hard to to um, model a, a function that appears to be non-continuous in reality with a continuous model. So th this is another reason why we, we were looking for a, a sol an extension. Okay, so very briefly now because my time is is running out and I don't want to. Um, hopefully, I can take two more minutes. Yeah, um, we, we, we come up with a, a model which is called mixture of experts. This is, a, this is a, an existing tool in machine learning. Uh, and it, basically the idea is that you're going to, um, um, to train not, not just one DNN per agent, but multiple DNNs per agent. Uh, if I want to take a, a, another analogy, Im imagine that you are in a company and you have to solve a, a, a product design problem and you have a bunch of uh, hardware engineers and software engineers. Okay, so your choice is like this. You want to know how to design your product as, as fast as possible. Either you can hire a set of hardware and software engineers and, and let them cooperate, let them work together, or you can hire a, a, mainstream engineers, all-purpose engineers that know both hardware and software. So of course, they're not going to be uh, experts, but they are going to be more knowledgeable at everything. While the experts 
are only experts at their small area, right? Which one is the best solution? Well, if you know how it works in any company, you know the best solution is to come up with, with experts. So you, you put in the room, not all purpose engineers, but a bunch of hardware and software engineers. And then you hire a manager that understands the capability of, of both of these groups and then decides uh, uh, to which group to give priority depending on the, on the type of problem that, that is arising. This is a little bit like that, that you can solve our problem here. We're going to use a bunch of different experts at each device. So now each device, so this is, this is not each device, like one, this is one transmitter. This is what's happening at one transmitter now. At one transmitter, I'm going to use um, multiple DNNs. I depends how many in it could be a couple, you know, two, three, four, five, ten, not hundreds, but um, enough. And then uh, you hope that each one of these DNNs is going to specialize its behavior to deal with a particular set of uncertainties. So basically to deal with a particular region of that space of uncertainties, you know? It's not clear in advance that they will specialize like that and, and possibly they will try to uh, you know, mimic each other and then you end up with a bunch of all purpose engineers. But it turns out that uh, quite surprisingly, it's not happening like that. They, they do specialize and they do become experts. Now, and then I need one more, one more DNN, which is sort of the manager is it's called a gating network. Come. And this gating network is a DNN that basically Come on. a bunch of weights. And these weights are going to determine which one of the experts to use at any point of time. Okay. So now I have to train all, all of these uh, expert DNN plus the gating network, I have to train all of that jointly. Okay, so I had to go a little bit fast. I hope it's clear enough. And I just want to show you the result now. So imagine that you're dealing with a situation where you, you, you are navigating in the space of uncertainty. So this is sigma one, this is sigma two. So initially, for example, both agents know the channels perfectly. And then uh, a few seconds later, um, it looks like agent two becomes has very bad information, but agent one still has very good information. Then a few seconds later, both agents have a bad information and so on. So I'm, I'm describing an arbitrary trajectory in the space of uncertainties. And now I train my, uh, my DNNs. I have the team DNNs and I have the team mixture of experts that I just presented. And I have the, the benchmark strategies that I have presented earlier. They are not using machine learning. Okay, uh, given the time, I'm going to skip the description of the parameters. If there are questions, I can always explain how many layers, how many neurons, and so on. And this is the interesting result. So as, as you see, as you move along in the, in the, in the trajectory, uh, and this is the sum rate, by the way, versus time, you see, in the beginning, both agents have perfect information. So all algorithms behave nice, or all get a nice throughput. As you move along, you, you degrade information at agent uh, two, things start degrading pretty bad, right? Especially for the, uh, the benchmark strategies, like uh, the, the weighted MMSC, for example, which is the classical uh, way to, to solve the, the, the power control problem. Uh, but, um, and, and by the way, let me see whether, okay, the team DNN is also there, is also suffering quite badly. Why is that? Well, because, I'm changing the, the, the value of, of my noise variance. And the, the, in this case, the team DNN do not have enough time to retrain. So they, they, they fall down in performance and then after enough retraining, they come back up, right? Actually, the mixture of experts are able to, to weather through this, uh, these uncertainties quite nicely. You see, so it degrades, of course, it has to degrade, but not as bad as the other algorithm, right? In fact, it's pretty stable. So this, this is uh, the, the, the main thing. And of course, if you have uh, more updates, more opportunities to retrain the team DNNs, then you can do a bit better. As you can see, the, the, the team DNN 
they suffer regularly, but then they have enough updates available so that they can come catch up, catch up with the experts. And then before falling back again, every time the noise statistics are changing. So basically the, the, the mixture of experts gives you a, a nice way to, um, to regularize the system and learn how to behave in the presence of arbitrary statistics. Uh, of course, the price to pay is you, you have a lot more offline training to be done, but then uh, online testing is actually much more smooth and, and has, gives you more performance. Okay, I will, I will stop here. Uh, there's a, a few references that you can look at here in this slide. Uh, I just want to say also one thing. Another interesting extension that we have considered is the case where the different agents are allowed to communicate information between themselves. However, if you need to make a, a fast decision, let's say within milliseconds, uh, you don't have to go, you don't have the time to, to necessarily uh, send the entire um, uh, information um, of one agent to, to neighboring agents. So you have to quantize your information. So you have to deal with the problem of building a message which has, which has finite rate. That problem itself is very interesting to tackle using DNNs. So in this case, you need to have yet one more DNN, which is a machine that is used to create a message. And the input of that DNN is the local observations. And the output is a finite bit message that is optimally designed to, to inform your partners about what's going on locally here to help coordinate. So again, I gave a reference on that, on that idea. Okay, I will stop here. Sorry for the uh, time extension, and I leave the floor for, for questions. Okay, <clears throat> so thanks, Derek, uh, very much for the nice talk. Uh, so let's move on to the Q and A. Uh, actually, the first cake, the first question comes from myself. So, uh, so I see that in your model, so you are actually maximizing like the team, uh, like the like the team utility. So, uh, but I just wonder, like, what if when you change a policy, does it also affect the distributions of your X1 and X1 hats, yada, yada? Uh, no, no, it's a good question. Okay, so uh, yeah, so we are not in this kind of setting where action uh, impacts on uh, observations. Oh, okay, thanks. so this, the, the, there's no reinforcement learning here needed. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, here, the observations are, um, if it's a wireless network, it's a, is the state mm -hmm. uh, of the channel. Mm -hmm. And then uh, no matter what power level is used by the other transmitters, that doesn't change the, 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 the state of the channel. I see. I mean, I'm, I'm asking this question because I'm thinking of the car example. <laughs> so because yeah, if you change so your policy, then definitely it's going to change the distributions of the artists as well. So. <laughs> But, yes, I see. But, exactly, exactly. So uh, in the car example, in fact, uh, we are about to, to publish a paper to, to, to um, show the use of, of this kind of approaches. And there, in fact, we use reinforcement learning because as you say, uh, every step of the operation, um, it changes the observations. For example, a, a very important observation is the distance uh, between yourself and the crossroad and, and between uh, the car and the crossroad. And that obviously changes depending on, on your past actions. So in this case, you need to, to change the model and take uh, reinforcement learning into account. Yes. I can, I can uh, give a, a indication on that, on that work uh, later if you're interested. Sure. Uh, so I think next we can ask Ken to unmute himself to, mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Yeah, um, yeah well, interesting stuff you present, presented. Now, uh, there is a basic question I would like to know about for the distributed power control problem. Now, uh, the problem is that uh, does the, each agent know the channel state information at the transmitter globally, or they only got local channel state information? Okay, yeah, okay, very good question also. So in, in this example, because I, I, I was interested in drawing some plots uh, that have to be simplified, I had, to, uh, I had to use a very simple model of uncertainties. So in this, in this model, basically the entire uh, G matrix is known up to a certain level of noise at one given agent. Okay, so, so yeah. So in, 
it's a, it's, a, it's simplified. However, mm. we also work on the case. And by, by the way, these these uh, team DNA models, mm -hmm. absolutely, and without without any uh, difficulty, extend to the case where you can have an arbitrary amount of uncertainties uh, at any one of the any one of the coefficients. So it means mm -hmm. that, for example, uh, it includes all the cases you can imagine. For example. Uh, mm -hmm. There are cases where one one transmitter is only aware of, uh, for example, the two physically uh, connected links, this one and that one. Mm -hmm. So this is all, this is included because in this case you will put no noise or little noise in those coefficients g11, g12, and then in the second ones you put a lot of noise. You put you put a sigma equal to one, which means that mm -hmm. it, it is not aware at all of these two other links. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Choose, I start to get yeah. what you're talking about. Or you can okay, have. A, so you a, can a, basically cheat where, that way. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you understand. So depending yeah, I understand on how, how you how you set up the noise uh, distribution, you you can adapt to any any physically imaginable uh, uncertainty model. Okay. Even you don't know it almost like. <laughs> what? Uh, even though you actually don't know the labels, general state information. Uh, you could also you could you you could cheat it by uh, assuming a sufficiently large noise in a sense. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, that's that's tricky. Oh, okay, oh, I like it. I like it. Yeah, because I asked this question based on a very simple reason. Now, right now, I'm 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 sufficiently happy with uh, what you demonstrated in this uh, simple example. But uh, as uh, research go, people might want to know about whether you can do it like uh, for multi-self or coordinate a multi-point where you don't, you, you only have local channel state information, but you don't have global. Uh, you could also think a lot of things such as uh, even like um, quantized feedback, for instance, well, which will become your observation headaches, things like that. So that, that yeah. yeah. So that was the things I'm thinking when I'm looking at your example. Yeah, so for, for example, uh, um, quantized feedback, no problem, because quantized feedback uh, can also be modeled as, as, a, mm. as quantized noise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is part of the model. And then, yeah, mm. like I say, mm. local, mm. Local, local knowledge is actually a particular case of global, no, of global knowledge, mm -hmm. just with mm -hmm. a, a specific kind of noise uh, distribution in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, cool, cool, cool. So I, I perhaps I'll leave uh, leave uh, leave it to other audience. I think there are a number of more questions yes. coming out. The next will be from by stranger. So I will, I guess we will uh, leave it to you to ask that question. Hey, Chandra, can you uh, can you hear us? Yeah, hi, uh, David. Uh, this is Chandra here. I just had a question about the last. Uh, summary plot you were showing um, the uh, TDMA and uh, um, oh, you mean uh, the plots or the yeah the plot the one before this yeah the TDMA yeah. and the centralized schemes the sum rate is completely horizontal over time so these two schemes are they not affected by the channel uncertainties yeah, because I didn't have time to explain. So TDMA is basically you, you take a random user and let let it be uh, active. So um, basically, one transmitter is active at a time randomly, and it, it does not be, does not depend on the on the on the state knowledge at all. Okay, you know what I mean. Yeah, but if the channel uh, state is uncertain, then it, it should affect the performance of uh, uh, even a TDMA scheme because you have uncertainty in the channel, right? No, no, because the, 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 the TDMA, um, the TDMA scheme is not based on, uh, it does not exploit the state of the channel. It's, 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 a, it's a random access. Okay, yeah, got it. Thank you. And how about the centralized scheme? The centralized scheme. Uh, okay, first I have to remember <laughs> what, with my student what what we assume by centralized scheme. 
Perhaps Maybe right now I do not remember what, what was the assumption, what was the meaning of centralized here. Perhaps it just picks the better user at each point in time. Uh, but if you were doing that, you would see a, a rate of a, a throughput that is higher than the, the random access. I have to get back to you on that. I don't. I don't remember the the, um, uh, the algorithm we use for centralized actually because it's it's too vague. I mean, there, there are so there's so many different versions that we can imagine, and I do not remember. I want, don't want to, to to say something wrong, so I, I need to get back to you. No, no, but no problem. Thank you. Okay, so uh, so John, Hui, what about you? Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks, Debbie, for for the talk. Yeah, so I want to follow uh, one question uh, is that uh, why is this the, the sound rate constant for centralized TDMAs because the underlying channel is, uh, is fixed and only you uh, at different level of noise? Okay, so like I was saying, I do, I do not remember um, exactly the algorithm for centralized, but for example, if you take TDMA, it's, it's constant because even though the channel is, is varying, we, we're averaging over time. So this is a Monte Carlo experiment. So it's definitely average over many fading realizations, but uh, uh, since the algorithm is not exploiting the, the, the knowledge uh, of the state of the channel, then it, it is not affected at all by how much noise you, you, you put there. Okay. Okay. Also, uh, I wonder, so now he, here you show the performance of WMSE. Have you tried some, like some robust power control schemes, for example? They have like some worst case of some probabilistic constraint, some conventional power control approach. Okay, uh, good question. So, so the thing that, first of all, I am not aware of a, a, a robust uh, algorithm that would be able to uh, tackle uh, th this kind of arbitrary noise statistics I'm dealing with here. Uh, I, I just don't know how to, how to write it down. So, uh, but ima imagine that you, that you, that you take a, 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 um, a particular set where you, you know, for example, you have a, a a, a particular distribution of noise for which you know how to derive uh, the robust power control, but not the distributed one, the, the, the centralized one. So assuming that basically you have the same amount of noise everywhere, and then you try to be robust to that. Um, then uh, even though it's not on the plot, if you do that, uh, most likely this would be similar to um, this one. Um, Oh, I know, I, di I didn't put it there. I, I thought I put the, um, uh, what I called the, the nice strategy number two. So it's going to be something that is, that is a bit worse than the, uh, the team DNN, because it's something where you, you don't, you're not trying to uh, account for the um, uncertainties at the other devices. You, you're only robust with your respect to your own observations. So there's all, there will always be a loss with respect to a truly robust solution, right? Because in a network, you have to be robust to your own noise, but also robust with respect to uh, the actions that other people around you are going to take. And for that, I do not know, I do not know uh, cross form or easily implementable, implementable algorithms. If you have references, uh, feel free to, to send me, but I'm not aware of anything. Usually, probably, what you call what you call the robust okay. uh, strategies are basically single agent uh, decision making policies. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so we also have a question about like whether so whether there are any other distributed learning methods that can be used for the distributed designs here. So besides the team or the team DNN that you proposed. Actually, I do not understand. Can you restate the, the, the question, please? Yeah, so the question is, uh, so besides a uh, team DNN, so is there any other distributed learning methods that could possibly be used for the distributed design? So I guess he is asking for whether, uh, whether there is other, other learning methods that can be used for, uh, for the settings where we want to find the distributed policies. Uh, yeah, yeah. I suppose. I suppose. I. I. I we haven't. Uh, so we have. We are looking at the reinforcement learning, 
mm -hmm. uh, methods. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but apart from that, we have not mm -hmm. looked at other methods. But at the same time, I'm pretty confident that there should be other methods that you can use mm -hmm. and, and sort of build up the necessary robustness through learning. Yeah, I, I believe so. Uh, so the last question that we got now is, uh, <clears throat> so it's about the realizations of the CSI. So, so uh, apparently what we are training for right now is actually uh, with respect to statistics of the CSI. Right. So when we so we so basically the the DNN that we trained it are adaptive to the statistics of those uh, channel state information, and yeah. uh, so but uh, in reality we have realizations of the CSIs. So in those cases, uh, do you require some retraining of the DNN rate to adapt to the realizations? And also, is it possible to do some sort of online training for that, which I believe is sort of done in your simulations, right? Um, so I'm not sure. I, I, are you referring to the problem that you need to uh, learn the noise statistics? Uh, is so. I guess the problem here is that so um, so you have already learned. The, so you so when you train your DNN, so it is trained. So it is uh, it is optimized with respect to the statistic of the CSI. Yeah. So, but uh, then when you put the systems into practice, the CSI changes at any every time when you uh, when you apply the, the system. And so do we? Do you do you also try to sort of adapt the system? You train it a little bit at yeah. every time slot. Which yeah, I think is one of the simulation. <laughs> This is, this is one of the uh, observations in that plot. As you can see, mm -hmm. uh, if you lose the, the, the team DNNs, mm -hmm. the team DNNs have to be trained with the amount of uncertainties that you expect to have in the network. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when you do, it, they, they behave uh, uh, properly, more or less. Mm -hmm. uh, but as soon as, as the statistics start to differ, a reality from what you, what you use in training, you, you start dropping in performance. So that's why you see those those little uh, fades here, mm. and then you start retraining, and then you start catching up a little bit, and then again falling down mm. because the noise statistics has changed. Right when you go from one point to the next, the noise statistics have changed, so you need to retrain. Yeah, yeah, right. So if I understand, if I if I interpret this uh, simulation results correctly. It is kind of doing an online training already for the retrain for for what you said to be retrain the TDNs. Yeah, this all all the all these blue uh, things here is uh, the result of online training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. While while the, the, with the mixture of experts, everything everything is trained offline, so you, you don't need online training, and it's much more you know uh, smooth. Yes. Uh, yeah, I see the, the advantages of doing so. Yeah, so uh, I guess the last question here is, uh, so so yeah, I read that maybe I can ask okay. that question on behalf sure. of you. It should be the last question, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's exactly this nice as well. Uh, the, the audience asks, have you tried more different paths? Okay, right now you try a path that you, you go up, you go horizontal, da da da. Okay, uh, he or she is asking whether you try other more fancy paths. Oh uh, yeah, we, we we try other path, but in the but I don't have plots for that. You know, this is uh, basically um, internal investigations and like trial and error uh, mm -hmm. uh, process that we that we have while making simulations. But what we have reported is only that path. Mm. I, I I don't know I don't know in advance if other paths are more meaningful. <laughs> okay. Actually, you know th this mm. is uh, it would be hard for me to imagine a wireless network uh, that produces uncertainties that follow this path. This is this is really a made up example, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you know if you want to have a real system study, you will mm. need to consider rather uh, uh, I would say. A system where you, you track the position of devices, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. consider a, a, a realistic feedback model, mm -hmm. and based on the position of devices, then you obtain the, the feedback noise statistics, 
-hmm. And that will give you a certain trajectory, mm -hmm. which we probably will going, is going to look much more strange and, and, and not as smooth as the one I've, I've shown here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if my understanding is correct, I mean, for this uh, mixture of experts, uh, um, no matter how paths you're talking about, this, uh, this offline training uh, mixture of experts would work. Uh, doing this fancy path is really allow is really to allow you to uh, uh, make uh, benchmarking with other algorithms where you want want them to do online retraining. Is that correct? Uh, I, I don't I don't know I, I'm not sure to uh, to understand uh, the question. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the mixture of experts model is is really not trained for specific paths. No, yeah, that's right. In fact, so, the, the mixture uh, of expert model for anything. is actually is trained to deal with a region. Mm, mm, so, mm. for example, yep, 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 yep. Mm. here here you have a certain region. Mm. So I what I do is that I discretize this region mm. in mm. enough points. Mm -hmm, I collect mm -hmm. a lot of training data mm -hmm, covering mm -hmm. points located in all this region. I don't know in advance what the system, what trajectory the system is going to describe. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm fully prepared in advance for for most of mm -hmm. most of points, so mm -hmm. I have to train for global region, and then when mm -hmm. I've trained for that, I can apply. Of course, mm -hmm. if in practice the system gives me an uncertainty point, which is I don't know there, uh, I'm not going to be prepared for that. I will I will have to retrain. Mm -hmm. All right, all right, all right. Then um, oh, no, actually, we <laughs> there's a few more questions question. coming. Yeah. So uh, told did you read that or you want to have a go over that? Uh, I read the first one, so uh, okay. So it's about the what if we have, what if we have some delay in the in the observations that we make during the train, uh, like during in the algorithms in the TDN, and how is that going to impact the performance? Uh, so we we looked at this D delay. Delay is just yet another source of noise. Okay. Uh, it can be modeled. So, for example, if you have a uh, a regressive model uh, for your observations, okay. then uh, you know there is certain coherence time. You add any delay to your observation, that's going to be the same as adding an extra notch of noise in there. So as long as you know how much delay you have, it to tell you how much noise you are, you're adding extra, and then um, basically the, the system will we will be able to uh, to uh, cope with it and, and learn to react to it. But, but what if like the delay coming from the, like coming to different agents are not the same? So what if like at agent one, it is the, uh, the information comes uh, delaying by one second, the other one delayed by 10 seconds, et cetera. Yeah, but that's no problem because the, these, uh, these particular team DNA and mixture of experts, they, they, are, they are trained to deal with, with asymmetries in the okay. in the um, space of, of um, you know uh, channel state information, so if, if one agent has a lot of delay and the other agent has a, uh, only small delay, that's exactly the the area where this, these uh, methods are very very useful. Mm -hmm. I see. So as long as long as uh, the device that has a little delay knows that the other device has a long delay. Oh. Okay, so it's important that that there should be this, this uh, global knowledge of joint statistics in advance that you can train properly the system. Got it. Got it. So, <clears throat> so Ken, did you address to- Okay, the... uh, yeah, I, I addressed that, but I, I want to double confirm with you. I, I took the liberty answer, answering the last question. Now, uh, I think it's better we look at the, um, um, the training objective function of your problem first. I mean, that, that page of this nice. Uh, you mean for the power control or for the general yeah, case? Yeah, uh, for the general case. Yeah, yeah right over there. Uh, that one. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Yeah, the question that, um, the question that was asking whether uh, it is a supervised learning method, and if yes, uh, where are, where are the labels? Now, but uh, if my understanding is correct, it's actually on supervised training. 
you don't uh, you don't have a label for the data. You just maximize the utility function. That's right. Uh, during the training, I am able to compute the utility here. So as long as I can compute the utility and its gradient, I, I can I can use the back propagation algorithm. I don't need labels. Mm -hmm. So I hopefully that addressed the question. All right. So uh, any other question from the floor? As the last call, I, <clears throat> I guess none, right? Well, uh, if no, uh, join me to thank uh, David again. Thank you. Thank you. And now usually.